hello everyone. Good afternoon. I'm guessing good afternoon, but hey, you could be in New Zealand and maybe it's morning. Uh, I want to welcome you to Creative Live, and I'm your friend Chase Jarvis, your host and your guide for the next 60 minutes, where we are having another one of my favorite conversations with one of the world's top creators. Uh, and before I reveal who that is, I, I mean, wait a minute, why am I pretending you know who it is? Um, but I've got a couple of housekeeping, housekeeping points before we dive in. And that is, I want to welcome you from wherever you are coming from today uh, and start off by, I'm looking at the comments. I know we're streaming to creativelive.com slash TV and to Facebook and Instagram and gosh, probably like three or four other platforms. So I'd love to know where you're coming in from and where you are in the world so I can share it with our esteemed guest um, that there truly is a global audience tuning in from around the planet. And also that allows you this comment function allows you to impact the outcome of the show. So I will make it my goal to share if there are popular questions or if you have things that you want to know, um, please ask them and I'll bubble those up for our guests so that she can uh, address them if it's something that I think that the, the whole community will be interested in. So looking forward to having you participate and help us steer the conversation today. And speaking of today, uh, I want to get to our guest, which is why I know you're here. Uh, Chantel Martin is an amazing visual artist that I've long admired, and she's best known for large-scale black and white drawings and collaborations with artists and institutions, including Kendrick Lamar, the New York City Ballet, Tiffany and Company, Puma, the Albright Knox Ga Art Gallery, the Museum of, Museum of the Moving Image, and the MoMA. And her upcoming exhibition, New Now, opens at New York City, the New Britain Museum of American Art. Later this year, her first art book in collaboration with Henny Publishing called Lines is out. It is incredible. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. And with all of that, it, it brings me great joy and pleasure and excitement uh, to welcome to the show today. Chantel, welcome from Jersey City, from New York. Live from Jersey City. Where are you at today? I'm in Seattle today, which is, as we were talking just before we went live, is I've mostly been here since uh, March 9th, which is the longest I've been in one state since I was in uh, junior high school. Um, but we're on the opposite side of the country. Thanks for, for tuning in, in in your evening time. I appreciate it. Fantastic. And, you know, I'm not sure you know, but there's two of you on the screen, so I don't know which one to look at. So. <laughs> Either one, you know, I, I come in two flavors. Um, but uh, just so you know, speaking of where we are today in New York, we've got uh, Wiltshire, England, UK is in the house. I want you to know that. Maryland, United States, Japan. we got Felipe in Japan, Monaco, uh, Mesa, Arizona, Michigan, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Darwin, Australia. So to say we have a global audience is an understatement, and they are all here for you. So thank you for showing up. I'm grateful. I say a lot of my favorite places there, Japan, New Zealand, Australia. So that sounds good. Nice audience. Yeah. And speaking of Japan, that's a great place for us to start because uh, I know enough about you to be dangerous, but not, not enough to speak for you. And that is why we're here today. So I'm here. I'm curious. Uh, what I know about your background is born and raised in the UK. And uh, I've heard you describe that upbringing is not really serving you. So at some point you jumped ship and went to Japan. And so I'm wondering if you can give us some background and context, A, for those who don't know your sort of origin story, your background in the UK, and, and take us from that background to going to Japan, speaking of Japan, and why? Well, that journey could take hours and hours. <laughs> I can keep it quite short. But, um, you know, essentially I'm, I'm from London, I'm from Southeast London. And I found myself living in Japan for five years. And, you know, it's kind of a long story and journey of how I got there. But essentially, you know, I kind of grew up living life following kind of this rule of saying yes to yes and no to no and not really knowing where that would take me. And, you know, I grew up in London, in southeast London, in this lovely place called Thamesmead. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's it's kind of the backdrop for movies like Clockwork Orange and TV shows like Misfits. And, you know, so one of these massive, like, project council estates, um, you know, that's built in, like, the late 1960s. And so that's where I grew up. And, 
And Thames Mead at that time of me growing up, very white, racist, working class. And, you know, a lot of the things that come with that, you know, at that time, very homophobic, very racist, all of those things. And then there's me, you know, brown with an Afro, kind of growing up in this place where I didn't feel like I fitted in. And I think for a lot of outsiders like myself, kind of art is a path that we can follow where we're able to express ourselves, where we're able to be creative. And lucky enough, you know, I was able to find that path and follow it to the point where it got me to a place like Japan. Was the, um, I think there's so many people around the world can identify with not fitting in on one different axis or another. You talk about, you know, being brown and having an Afro, that's one way, but there's lots of different ways that people don't fit in. And I'm curious if you found your journey inward to be, uh, to be medicine for that, or was your move to Japan required in order for you to stay sane? Cause so many people at home right now might be in that similar situation, but not, might not be able to get up and get out to Japan. So a, can you talk a little bit about your internal journey and then B what you were, what you did in order to, um, not even conceptually, but to literally sort of escape those confines and the things that made you, you know, feel like an outsider. It's funny, you know, growing up in Thamesmead and then many, many, many years later, you know, a show like Misfits is filmed there. Because I think, you know, finding this path to art school is where you end up with people who are outsiders for many different reasons. You know, the music they listen to, the way that they choose to dress, the things that they're interested in, the way that they think about things. And so kind of finding this path to art school and being surrounded completely by a bunch of misfits, a bunch of outsiders, you know, people who look differently, think different. And I think in that place, it was the first place I understood that was safe in a way. Mm -hmm. In that environment, being different is celebrated. Unlike, you know, a lot of schools and places that we grow up in, you have that pressure to fit in with everyone else. And for me, you know, exteriorly, I just, I couldn't even try to fit in, you know. So, you know, I, I love that, you know, going to art school was this place where I ended up with everyone that didn't fit in. And, you know, in a way there is medicine to that. There's medicine to understanding that you have a place because if you like it or not, when you're younger, you want to fit in. You know, there, there is a part of you that wants to be accepted. There's a part of you that wants to be a part of the group. And then when you're not, it's much it's so rewarding when later in life you find your place is not to fit in and there's so many people like you and, and I, there is such a medicine in that. Mm. And how did that play a role in you deciding to leave? Was it the number one thing? Was it like the fact that I don't fit in either in my family or in my community that caused you to leave or was there some different aspiration at work or some combination? You know, when I look back, you know, you have this power of reflection and, and I look back now and I'm like, oh, wow, that was my first passport in life. You know, my first passport was not fitting in because that always made me look to the outside. And kind of back then we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have social media. We didn't really, you know, have the ability to imagine beyond the kind of streets that we were walking around in. And so not fitting in was that passport to imagine a future outside of that reality, outside of that world. And, you know, that got me to art school. But then beyond that, you know, I, I go through that whole system and I graduate from a, you know, a very respectable, fancy art school in London called Central St. Martins. And then when I did, there was another barrier, another chapter where I realized like, oh, art's basically a bunch of nepotism. And I worked really hard to get here. And now there's another barrier, there's another blockage, there's another subtle way of me not being able to achieve and imagine what I could do. And so at that time, Japan seemed like the most foreign and mystical and new place to imagine. So I decided to go there. And I, I initially got interested in Japan because in my school, you know, it was very international. So there's a lot of Japanese students there. And I became that kid that hung out with all the Japanese kids and, you know, just really got interested in Japanese art and music and film and, you know, art from the Edo period and got obsessed about it. So when I graduated, I thought, you know what, I'd rather go to that magical, mystical place over there and figure it out than staying here and kind of knowing what my path is and, and feeling like there was a dead end. Because 
the thing is, is when you're a part of these types of systems, especially if you're born into them, you become a part of it if you like it or not. You, a part of you accepts it and plays into it. Whereas, you know, going to somewhere like Japan was a totally new place where the rules that were there or are there at that time felt like they didn't apply to me. Mm. And what did you do specifically to, I guess I'm thinking of it in terms of like escape velocity, like how does one from Southeast London or whether you consider that the, the your sort of um, roots or maybe even art school, um, how did you like tactically, how did, did you just get on a plane or did you have some connections? Did you make a friend or was it like I bought a plane ticket and threw my stuff in a in a backpack and and away I went to figure it out. Yeah, it was a little bit of, you know, it's like a big giant jigsaw puzzle and you're trying to put all the pieces together. And at that time, you know, the the way that people went to Japan is through the JET program, which was the teaching English program. And I applied for that and I didn't get it. So I, I looked for other ways of getting to Japan. And at that time, it seemed to be the only way was through an English language school who teach in English. So I actually, I went to, actually, I don't really talk about this much, but I went to Knight College and I got a certificate in English language teaching, which is called the CELTA. And that was interesting because I'm so dyslexic. Um, but I took this Knight course in teaching English and actually that taught me that you know, you can be quite dyslexic, but there are ways of maneuvering around that. You know, if you learn your weaknesses within your, um, I guess, your your structure of, of dyslexism, um, there's ways around that. And so I, I learned to teach English through this CELTA course. And then with that, found the job teaching English in Japan and then packed my bags and got on a plane and went out there. Got it. I think that's really interesting and also very helpful for you to share because so many people think, well, I just packed all my bags and landed in Japan and didn't have a plan and then it didn't work out. So I came home. But when I, whenever I asked that question, like what was, how did you actually do it? Whether, and this seems to apply to so many things where you're transitioning from one job to another, or from one, you know, career path to another or one country to another, that there was a set of, even, even if they were sort of, uh, simple or crude or obvious, there was a little bit of a plan in place. And it sounds like you had just enough to go on. And then I love this little linear path that we're on here. So then you, you land in Japan and presumably you go to work at this job that you secured before you left. But something tells me that the culture, I guess maybe because I've watched a lot of videos and read a lot about you, but uh, the culture and, uh, you know, how, again, Japan is so, you know, there's so much um, presence. There's a lot of respect and appreciation for craft and design and beautiful, simple things. Was that a part of the reason? And if so, did you find that to be true when you got there? And, and how did that impact you? I think quite simply, initially, it was just this foreign place that was so different from where I was from. And, you know, like I said, like the rules there didn't apply to me. And also, it didn't really matter what I was or where I was from there, because you're either Japanese or you're a foreigner. But it was an interesting reality shock in a way because, you know, this young girl from Southeast London, from Thamesmead, freshly out of art school, gets on a plane and goes to Japan. And my teaching job is in the middle of the countryside in Nagoya, in a place called Komakishi. Not that many foreigners there. No one really speaks English there. No one really looks like me there. And actually, I had a horrible time. You know, this is the first time I'm living alone, I'm working full time, I'm in the middle of the countryside, I don't speak the language, I don't know what I'm eating. And also, I can't call anyone or contact anyone because we don't have smartphones then. And so I remember this experience of going into a 7-Eleven and trying to communicate with someone that didn't speak English and someone that didn't speak Japanese at that time to buy a phone card. And so that was like a whole ordeal. And then you finally buy a phone card and then you look at the back of the phone card and it's all in Japanese. So then you take this phone card to a phone box and you try and call this operator who only speaks Japanese. And you know, like two hours later, you're kind of in tears because you, you, you can't get through. And then you finally get through because you've cracked this puzzle and you have like five or 10 minutes. And then it's like, beep, 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 beep. Um, 
So, you know, it was definitely not an easy transition um, going there and, you know, also just having people kind of stare at you and point at you. And I also had a stalker um, at the time, you know, I, I was living in this apartment on the second floor and, you know, there'd be times where I'd go outside to my balcony and there'd be an ashtray full of cigarettes at, and then there'd be footprints up the, up the pole. So I had a stalker that was literally climbing up onto my balcony, sitting there all night and smoking. Um, and then I got the police around and the police just said, hey, you know, you're big, uh, you're tall, you can defend yourself. Like, mom die nine there, there's no problem. Um, and that's actually when I packed my bags for the second time and I moved to Tokyo without a job, without a plan, just knowing that, you know, I didn't want to kind of risk just being that I'm tall enough to defend off any crazy, uh, you know, people that might be sleeping on or smoking on my balcony. Oh my gosh, how horrible. Yeah. And it's an you know, interesting experience, but you know, at, I think at that time, you know, I felt so alone. Um, and I think that was reflected in the things that happened to me or the, you know, the situations I ended up in or even the work that I created at that time. But in a way, I think that's the experience I was looking for because when you're, you feel completely and utterly alone, that's when you really get to discover and find out yourself and who you are because you don't have people around you telling you who you should be or what you should be doing and you're not living up to any of those stereotypes. And then you don't even have those forms of communication where you stay in touch at that time. And so I think the, you know, in a way it just beat out of me everything that everyone taught me of how I should be to the point where I kind of depleted all of that, where I could build myself up again. Uh, that, I love the metaphor of tearing down and, and being sort of reborn. And I remember also, is there something in your past where you had some teachers that told you that you would not, be successful at art or that you didn't have talent or I remember seeing or reading something about that and I'm wondering if there's a little bit of was there a chip on your shoulder mentality or was that just was that just a, a really painful blow and how did you respond to both you know anyone suggesting what you could or couldn't be and and perhaps it was it paralleled this experience that you had in Japan of deciding who you were going to be in your own words on your own terms. I wonder if there was a connection between those two moments or or if they were just separate. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't call it a chip in your shoulder. You know, I'd call it just reality and the, and the systemic society system that exists. You know, mm -hmm. I'm from uh, a low income working class family where no one finished school, no one around me finished school. You know, my friends at that time didn't finish school. And so, you know, me being someone that actually went to school there aren't really any expectations. There aren't really any mentors or people to look up to. There aren't really any um, people to look like, oh, they went to art school, so you can. So, you know, what happened at that time is, you know, I, I went to school and it's in England, you finish school and maybe you go to university and I had interest in maybe going to art school. And my art teacher simply said, Chantel, don't apply because you won't get in. And, you know, for a long time that did bother me because they didn't have the imagination for me to do something unexpected. Or there was just such a long line of people where I'm from that haven't achieved something like that. So why would they imagine that I could achieve it? You know, when I look at it now, I'm just like, oh, maybe that teacher was just being responsible or realistic. Because when you don't show people who they can be or what they can do, when you don't give people the tools to succeed, when you reserve those tools for people from privilege, from certain types of schools, from certain types of incomes, from certain types of background, then why would you expect some girl from Thamesmead, who's the first person in her family to finish school, to go to art school and apply to it and get in? You know, and so... For a long time, I, I was kind of angry at that interaction, but then now I look back and I'm like, oh, well, that's just part of the systemic system of the society that we have in places like England, where he was just simply being realistic. Mm. Well, I'd like to shift gears from that, that moment where you were, or that, that window of time, rather, when you were, as you talked about, I think getting programmed or the ideas that everyone else had from you and shift gears to 
clearly you created a world of possibility for yourself. And before I go on, I do want to, you know, give a shout out to, we've got again, a couple of extra countries, uh, Canada, Brazil, um, more UK in the house, India, Pennsylvania, people are cheering you on from around the world and saying, thank you for being such an inspiration. Uh, to that point about, about the inspiration and the inspirator that you are, uh, at some point you, you clearly shifted gears and, um, was it in Tokyo where you, where you started to feel more alive and in the driver's seat or was that later in New York? Help us sort of put a bow on this, this sort of pre you identifying and maybe making a living as an artist as in, instead of uh, sort of piecing together the, you know, a, a, a view of yourself and a view of what was possible and an income and all these other things. This there's transition phase, if you will, was that completed in, in Japan and Tokyo or did that really come to life in New York? So you use an analogy, the driver's seat. So what does that look like? What's uh, what do you mean by being in the driving seat? Um, I, I guess what I meant by it was um, shifting gears. Another terrible metaphor. Um, where right, so that maybe that's why I'm struggling with the. Uh, yeah, no, I guess to. Um, sh let's see, what's the right way of thinking about this? Um, going from the feelings that you had being an outsider because you cited being an outsider in your hometown and then also the phone card not knowing the language and not being able to adapt to the to the um the the communication across the telephone for example and then at some point i'm wondering was it one incident or was it a series of incidents where uh it seemed like you were able to be in charge and these, uh, the outside forces, you um, surmounted them and were able to communicate and were able to break through. Is there a moment, a series of moments? You know, I don't know if there's a series of moments, but I just, one word just keeps coming to mind and that's just the word of progress and progress. Mm. You know, when you simply put one foot in front of the other, and you keep doing that, it's very grassroots, but at some point you make a breakthrough and you make some traction and you create some opportunities. And, and you know, I have an analogy for that, but I'm on a boat. And, you know, so imagine I get in this little rowboat and I row to the middle of a gigantic lake and I throw out my anchor and then I stand up in this rowboat and I rock and I rock and I rock and I work and I work and I work and you see these massive ripples appear and these ripples are so big that they disappear from me but eventually they come back to me in the form of jobs and opportunities and collaborations and ideas and if I stop rocking, if I stop working, the ripples stop doing their thing and they stop kind of affecting and you know kind of have this motion. So I think the answer to that question is that there hasn't been a moment or a time or an event. It's been about consistency and being consistent for many, 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 many years. And, you know, in Japan, I was there for five years in the end. And so the first year I couldn't speak Japanese. And then the second year I could understand a little bit more Japanese. And by the third year, I could speak a little bit of Japanese. And by the fourth year, I got to really use that Japanese. And also the same with the art. You know, when I got there, the art I was creating was like very much for me. And it was very much in this space. And it was about me kind of getting to know myself or find myself. And the more I was there, I got to look up and I got to find the opportunities to share what I was creating. And I think that's just the perspective um, and the journey of my career as a whole, it's very, very grassroots. It's about putting one foot in front of the other and kind of having a good intention behind that. And having this idea that I'm moving away from something dark and unknown and moving towards something very light and positive and known and whimsical. And I can see that within my work. When I look back at my older work, 
it's very dark, it's very lost, it's very depressed, it's quite helpless. And I look back at that work and I'm like, wow, who, who was this person? They were, you know, they were so lost and they had no idea the future that could have been or is. But I put one foot in front of the other and now the work is very light and whimsical and positive and, and um, has a benefit for other people in that way too. Well, that's much more beautiful uh, way of thinking about it than the driver's seat. Um, <laughs> painted a beautiful a beautiful picture there um ash jensen from facebook says beautiful um lynn faustine from esperado california says thank you so much for that and francis has got an amazing story of creative success so you this journey of also learning to speak the language it, it underscores that point you just made of continual progress it wasn't like I feel like what we read in the newspapers and what we compare ourselves to is like, oh, I moved to Japan and then I became fluent in six months because I took an advanced program and then everything was bright and sunny. And I just, you know, that's what we see on Instagram maybe or what we read in the in um, pop culture, but what people are attracted to. And and, and thank you for sharing what the, the, the reality is this idea of putting one front one foot in front of the other. Um, Take us to New York now. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah, take us to New York, <laughs> where you are now. And take take us from Tokyo to New York. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I live in Jersey City, but I did live in New York for many years. So I, and it's quite a funny trajectory in the sense of going from London to Tokyo to New York to Jersey City. But but I love that. So I, I moved to Jersey. What? Well, I moved to Jersey a couple of years ago, but before that, I moved to New York in 2009. So, you know, also not probably the best time to move to America. You know, it's kind of middle of a recession and there was a huge crisis here. And I moved here from Japan at that time because I met some Americans in Japan and realized that, you know, all Americans weren't that bad. Um, you know, stereotypes do exist and, and in the UK, you know, we have stereotypes about the loud American. And um, so why would I ever want to go there? But I made some incredible friends in Japan from America who got me interested in, and intrigued by New York and Boston. So in 2008, I came to New York for a holiday and I loved it. And there was such a contrast from Japan. You know, Japan and Tokyo is this place that I love. But you could walk out of your house and be out for 12 hours and not one person would speak to you because, you know, there's a culture of not wanting to have confrontation with anyone. And so the best way to not have confrontation with anyone is not to involve yourself with anyone, and especially if they're a foreigner, there could be, you know, situations of misunderstanding. But then coming to New York in 2008, you know, I'd bump into people, people would talk to me on the street, in the restroom, in the park, in a coffee shop, and they didn't want anything. It was just interaction, it was conversation. It was this cliche of New York, you know, the energy, the people, the vibe. And I was so ready for a change because I think in Japan, I found my feet and I found myself and I found my voice and I found my philosophy and I was willing to use those things. And so I went back to Japan, I applied for an artist visa, uh, used kind of my savings to find a lawyer in New York and do that whole application. And six months later, I found myself in New York. And at that time, I realized what a mistake I made because, you know, New York on vacation is actually a very different thing as New York once you've moved there. And so, you know, it does have those things, the energy, the people, but also I very quickly found out if no one knows who you are in New York, they don't care who you are. And everyone is an artist trying to do what you're doing. And this career that I created for myself in Japan didn't exist in New York. And so essentially I had to start all over again. And, you know, this, this scene or this medium that I was creating in Japan or DJing, you know, doing visuals in the clubs to DJs and dancers and musicians at that time didn't exist in New York. And so it was such a struggle. It was such a struggle to 
find places to live, to find work, to find a new fan base, to, you know, find myself again. But, you know, I, I wouldn't change things now. But at that time, I, you know, I look back and I, I think, why didn't I do it gradually? You know, why did I have to jump in? But I guess that's just how, you know, I've been. It's like, okay, I want to go there. So let's just go there. And then you figure it out that your your background and story is so inspiring and uh we could uh, i could spend the next hour asking you questions about your background because i think it it um there's so so many um so many it's like a layer it's like an onion there's so much going on but what i'm i know that the the people a couple thousand people here watching and listening are dying to know a little bit about your process because your work is incredibly recognizable. And that is, um, one lens through which you can consider having made it. If your work is recognizable and the line that you draw that has, has a signature behind it, just, just the line in and of itself. So I'm wondering if you could help us understand a little bit more, um, about your signature style, uh, about how you developed it and maybe walk us through the different sort of the live performance aspect to it all the way to maybe to the monograph, your, your, your book or anything you want to cover in there. But just the idea of personal style is, is, um, seems so evasive to so many creators and entrepreneurs that are trying to find their way in the world. Like how, how do I have a personal style? How do I develop it? How will I ever be recognized? Like you just talked about in New York. So how did you do that? And, and what do you do today to keep it going? We'll take those in two parts. How did you first create this voice that you now so clearly command? So I'm sure you can relate to this journey as a photographer of, you know, finding your creative voice. For sure. I really love the word process because process is about getting to learn things, getting to understand, getting to share, getting to connect, having an experience. And so you know, it, now I look back at schools and I'm like, wait, why do art teachers tell students to look at other work or to look at other artists to find people's own style? Um, I found my style, I found my fingerprint, I found my identity because of process and because of practice. And I discovered it, you know, it was there anyway, but I really truly discovered it in Japan, working live, creating live. And so I, I had this opportunity because I was drawing these really small detailed drawings at the time when I moved to Japan. And a friend said, you know, I'd love you to do some drawing at an event I'm organizing and there'll be a band playing music and you could stand next to them and draw on a canvas. And I said, well, the drawing I'm creating now is so small. So what if I draw under a visual presenter or an OHP and we project that onto the band? And also, you know, we're a TV nation. If there's a screen playing and music playing, we instantly connect those two things with our brains. And so what happened is I set myself up. I've got a sketchbook. I've got pens. I've got magnifying glasses. I've got post-it notes. I'm set up under an overhead projector. And there's a band in front of me. It's in an avant-garde Japanese club. It's noise music. It's music that I have no experience with whatsoever. And the first time I did this, the band starts playing and the music sounds really wild. It's just like, whoa, this is music. And so I froze and I had this kind of, you know, epiphany that once I froze and I was so shocked by the music that the band was playing, the screen was blank. Nothing was happening because my mind went blank. And I realized like, oh, I, I can't overthink this I can't hesitate I can't be insecure I just have to draw I just have to make marks I just have to follow the music and, and see where the pen and the line wants to go and 45 minutes later the band finishes playing and I look down at the drawing or the journey that I've been on and there's this amazing drawing and I'm like wow that's what I look like that's my style and now imagine you repeat that, you repeat that, you repeat that, you repeat that, you extract, you extract, you extract. And you have that power of reflection where you can look back at all of your drawings and start to say, oh, that's me, that's me. Those lines are me, those words are me, those shapes are me, those, you know, those thinkings are me. And those 
are a combination of your language, of your style, of your fingerprint, of your identity. And so for me, that was a really magical journey or acceleration of finding my style as an artist. And also the benefit I realized of doing that is a couple of things. It kept me honest. Because I didn't have time to think, I didn't have time to plan, I didn't have plan to hesitate. It meant that I didn't have time to be anyone else but myself. So it was keeping me honest as an artist, but also the, the by default or product or result was that the audience got to share in your process. The audience were able to see how these drawings were constructed. And therefore you create that connection and that experience, which essentially art is about. So for a lot of artists, when I say, you know, or when they ask me, how do I find my style? I'm like, it's in you. You've just got to find these moments where you take that time away, where you can extract it, and then you can repeat that process. And then you look back to see what the column, you know, the, the, the common elements are. And that essentially forms your style as an artist. Well, you use the word, like, I love the idea of process too. I'm a process person. I just would go out with a camera every day. And you, if, once you've taken thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of pictures, you start to be able to see commonalities in whatever you photograph, whether it's a car, a human, a plant. And is I'm wondering, use this word extraction. Is that what you mean? Is it that the common elements of all of these different aspects of your work, is that what you're doing? You're sort of distilling it to the simplicity. I love the concept of extraction. I just want to know what you mean. Totally. So, you know, for yourself, there's a core of you, right? As a photographer, you have a core. But you can't find that core until you extract it. So you have to go out and take thousands and hundreds of photographs so that then you can look back and have that power of reflection. And you say, oh, you know, I always crop the sky like this or I always kind of, you know, center things up like this or I'm always taking pictures from this angle. And then those things create your identity and your fingerprint. And it's the same with drawing. You know, I look back at hundreds of drawings. And I'm like, oh, I'm always using these words or I'm always using these phrases or the lines are always like this. Or there's this combination of faces and birds and characters. And and then once you have that, you almost have a key or a language that can be deciphered, you know, and, and with my drawings, you know, we, we and, and that's actually, you know, this power of reflection for me is now in the form of a book. And you, you mentioned you know, lines, which is my first art book and monograph, uh, I have a copy here. But the power of having a book now, I get to look back and I get to see those recurring themes, but executed in all sorts of different mediums. Uh, it's, it's, and again, for anyone, I cannot recommend it enough. It's called Lines. If you went to Chantel Martin, S-H-A-N-T-E-L-L, -L, that's two L, Martin Lines, the word lines.com, uh, of course, on Amazon, it is absolutely beautiful and stunning. Uh, there's some great uh, conversation pieces in there, an essay from Hans Ulrich Obrist, um, where there's a conversation between Hans and Chantel. It's just remarkable. I can't recommend it enough. Um, and uh, can you hold it up right there? That's amazing. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for a, you know, so, so that's the cover, Chantal Martin. Yeah. The scale of the book, too, if you hold this book, it's like, oh, it's so beautiful. So let's see if I can find something interesting. But, you know, it's, it is this idea of just allowing, not rushing. Um, you know, this is some of my older drawing that I mentioned that I was doing in Japan, where it's, you know, a lot more detailed. And, you know, it's also just about having fun. I think a lot of people are in a rush now. But... Starting my career in, in Japan really taught me this idea about being patient, about trying to master something. And for me, it was about a line, you know, and you spoke earlier about things being recognizable. When you practice so much about something, you know, it can become yours because you kind of own it after a while. And I love the fact that anyone and everyone can create a line. But if you look at my line, you can say, oh, that's Chantal Martin's line. And now imagine how much work has to go into it to make something that everyone on the planet can create recognizable. And so with the line work, it's amazing because it's so simple in its form and in its appearance. 
But once you kind of delve into that, there's such a profound complexity in it. That, that to me underscores the point, like people have done it with words, but even words, you have to have, you know, hundreds or tens, at least hundreds, probably usually thousands in the form of an essay or a book to have a style emerge. And yet you can do it with a line that is arguably the most simple vehicle on the planet. And yet, as you said, as soon as you start to peel back the layers, it just becomes infinitely complex. And, and, you know, sitting here and knowing, you know, having, um, done so much work in photography and understanding how much work goes into it and mastery, I can only imagine the infinity <laughs> of work that goes into mastering something as beautiful and simple and yet complex as a line on a page. Did, did, were you aware of that? In, and would you ever have taken it on if you knew what you were getting into? I think also, you know, the nice thing about lines is that it's an invitation. You know, because if people look at a line drawing and they say, oh, that's so simple, I could do it. And so you're giving someone permission, you're inviting them to do something because creatively there is a benefit from us all drawing. You know, we do it as children for a reason, to get to know our world, to have this tool of extracting ourselves, to understand our experience between our head and our heart and our hands. And, and it's a shame that we all don't continue that practice. And so I love when something is so simple that someone says, I can do that. You give them access, you give them permission, you kind of inspire them in a way. I never knew that I would end up on this journey. For me, it was just the most accessible tool that was around when I was growing up. You know, lucky enough, you know, my, my, my hidden secret wasn't being a marine biologist. It was this drawing. And, and as a kid, this was a thing that was accessible to me, it was available to me. I could pick it up and this tool in its simplicity has enabled me to do so much and accomplish so much and create so much. Oh, stunning. And makes me want to shift gears to a, a topic that, you know, this, the concept of supporting artists and you talked about sort of relating and an invitation and, I read a piece in the New York Times in July. Um, obviously, we're at a point of um, in the process of we reworking um, centuries of racial injustice. And there was a piece about rushing to use black art and leaving artists feeling used. And it was a powerful piece. And I'm wondering um, if you have a, a comment on that or I also, there are people here are saying art is so stunning and how do I find access to it? You know, I think the book lines is one way, but I'm wondering if you can, can, can suggest other ways that, um, people can connect with you and your art is your art for sale. If so, how, where, when, um, I don't want to, I, I want to, you know, give you the opportunity to share the best place for the community to connect with your art. Where would you steer us? And in a way that's respectable and respectful of the art that you have created. So I feel like there was 10 questions rolled in. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, it's a complex idea. And the, the art, the, the, the New York Times, the title is A Rush to Use Black Art Leaves Artists Feeling Used. And the goal of this community is to support, create, communicate, connect, and lift one another up. So can you give us some ideas on how to best connect with you and your art without in a way that supports you rather than using your art. I know there are instances where your art's been stolen by others. And if this community is aiming to lift one another up, where would you steer them to connect with your art and, and, and buy, I know you have limited edition and you have open edition steer us towards that, uh, that work if you could. So for, for me now, you know, the first thing you can do is get a copy of Lines or gift a copy of Lines to someone that you think needs a creative outlet or break right now. I've got some beautiful art prints on absoluteart.com. So if you want something on your wall or you also want to give something to a friend, absoluteart.com. And then in general, you know, Instagram, YouTube, the website, you know, these are all places where you can get to learn more about my work. And then in general, to answer kind of the bigger question there of, you know, how do you support 
artists and black artists and creatives, it's, you know, everyone can just try and do better. You know, everyone can, from the releases or the agreements that you have for them to sign for projects, you know, is this the best thing that, you know, you should be given to this person or to this group? You know, um, when you hire people for a project, you know, am I reaching out to them because I care about them or I want to, you know, support this person's career. Have I had that history of doing it? And if not, maybe I want to just ask and consultants or advisors to make sure that I'm doing it in the right way. You know, and I think also just simply doing it from a place of good intention. You know, if you do pretty much anything and you're good intended, most of the time the support is there. You know, the communication is there. The understanding is there. When you try and do something that is performative just because maybe everyone else is now, then that's when maybe we make more mistakes or when we trip up a lot more. I also think, you know, we maybe we might make mistakes along the way, but it's important to keep trying and keep trying to support. So, you know, for, for me, like I said, you know, go get a print, go get a book, go watch some of my YouTube videos, you know, go follow me on Instagram. But as a whole, just really think about what you're consuming, what you're posting, what you're reacting to, how you're being distracted. How can you do better? How can you be better? How can you make any interaction that you have with an artist, with a black artist, with an artist from minority, how can you make that interaction better for them or that situation more of a win-win for them? Thank you for that. That was beautiful. Um... So what I was listening to with the previous answer to this, your stylistic evolution, it got me thinking about there's, it seems like there's a trust and you talked about being paralyzed for a second and then just realizing that I need to make marks on this paper. I'm here doing this live and I'm fascinated by this concept of trust and specifically learning to trust oneself. Was that inherit in who you've always been was that a learned behavior and if so can you share with us you know the experience of learning to trust yourself as an artist across your career trust is a journey you know and it's a journey for all of us and i think combined with trust is permission and confidence and experience you know when i was younger you know trust was rolled up in being defiant and trusting that people didn't have my best interests at heart. And so I was gonna be defiant and kind of go against the grain. And so, you know, for me, that was a little bit of a personality there. But, you know, trust is something I've learned to build through this practice of doing things live, through this practice of creating gigantic, enormous pieces of work. You know, if I'm creating a 200 foot drawing, spontaneously, I have to trust that compositionally, that things will work out. And I have to trust that I won't hesitate. I have to trust that I won't try and be someone else. I have to trust that I'm gonna approach it with good intention and confidently. And to do that, I have to give myself permission. But to get that permission, I have to trust myself and I have to trust that I have that. And so, you know, those experiences you know, I think for everyone, you know, we all have our individual journey of trust and we all have our individual journeys of giving ourselves permission. Mm. A couple of questions from Instagram live. First of all, uh, Yule shoots is a comment. It's not a question. It's just, thank you for being so fearless to always begin again on your journey through from London to, um, to Japan and to New York. And then, um, Spiker Helms talked is, is his or her or their question. I'm not quite sure is when you started, did you model your work from someone you admired or did it come from some other place? So that's, you know, it's an interesting question because I feel like if I modeled my work on someone else's work, I have to work 10 times as hard to find myself. And that's why it's so important for teachers, for students to practice the extraction of self, to go inside for inspiration versus going outside. 
And you can do that by being mindful, by meditating, by taking time away, by tricking yourself, by blindfolding yourself and just drawing and seeing what happens. But doing that over and over and over and over again so you can see naturally who you are. The issue with trying to mimic or copy or base yourself on someone's own work or someone else's work is that you're getting further and further and further away from yourself. And now you have to work twice as hard to get back there, to get inside there, to start extracting that. And lucky enough for me, growing up, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have you know, social media, we didn't have smartphones. So the way that we learn about other artists was primarily through the library. And me being a huge dyslexic as I was, I never went to the library. And so in a way I missed out on this opportunity from learning from other artists from these books because I didn't ever go to the library. But now when I look back, I feel like I'm so lucky that I didn't go down that path of trying to be inspired by others. And I ended up on this more organic path of extraction, of live drawing of collaboration. Mm. I'm going to uh, ask you to reflect on a couple specific pieces of your work. And um, in particular, uh, the three words, who are you? They repeat so many times and so often in your work. You are you are you you. You know, this is complexity, but the simplicity there, I'm wondering where, where that came from and um, what it means to you. Who are you? The first three letters of who are you are W-A-Y. You know, so on one hand, you have this big existential question of who am I? Who am I at the core? Who am I as an individual? Who am I as a, in the collective? But if you break it down to a simplistic way, it's about how are we finding our way in life, W-A-Y. For me, I'm finding my way in life through journey of words, of lines, of drawing. And initially I came to these questions because I would see myself or think of myself as one way. And then I would walk out of my house or walk out of my front door and be treated another way because I looked different and people treated me differently. And so I would question who I was or how I should fit in or if I should even try to fit in or even if I could fit in. And I had to really question my identity. And then when you question your identity from an exterior, then you start to question your identity from an interior. And so these questions I realized were a benefit, not just for myself, but for everyone else because everyone else was putting this baggage onto me so I thought, well, what if I give them this gift of this question of reflection so that they can plant that question within themselves as a seed and see where they're coming from and see where they could be going. Mm. Wow. Amazing. So again, there's just, I read some, some more really interesting quote and I'm, I'm going to botch it. And, but it's something just about like, there's, it takes uh, so much time to take, something that is so complex and make it so simple and it's in that simplicity that there's you know uh, infinity of complexity and i just see that over and over and over again in your work and it's it's very inspiring um i'm wondering if you can comment a little bit about uh, let's go back a little bit to this process this immediacy you know the live aspect there's so much energy when you're you know, doing this in front of a, you know, with a live band or in a live audience, you know, how does that relate to the work that you do and, or do you still do work just for yourself in quiet times and quiet spaces? Are you attracted to one or the other more? And if so, you know, why? Do you have a preference? You know, it's, it's interesting. I feel like if I'm creating for myself, I'm so easily distracted that I'll end up doing something else. You know, I'll, I'll sit down and intend to do some drawing, but then I end up, you know, watching TV or going for a walk or doing something else. But actually, I have a sketchbook on the table, and I can show you some drawings that I've been doing for myself. Oh, I would love that. People are going crazy in the comments. Please show us. Oh, wow. 
this is a drawing I did for myself, and you might say, oh, wow, it's colorful, there's color. Because I think with myself, I tend to perhaps explore a little bit more, to daydream a little bit more, you know, here's another one. Mm. And so, also I think with myself, I'm, I'm more inclined to use smaller pens and kind of get closer to the paper. Whereas the live work, it's become a little bit of this like bigger is better or, or I'm challenging myself to see how big I can go. And so the scale keeps growing and growing and growing. And so by myself, it's been so nice to create these more um, detailed or cozy or intimate pieces of work. Question from Facebook, Yul M. Butler asks, well, first of all, comments, so, so grateful for your sharing. Second is the question, do you find journaling at all helpful and or is are your sketchbooks some sort of some similar meditation or, or a, a form of journaling we'll just talked about journaling for a second to us yeah I, I love journaling and you know diaries and a lot of my earlier work or my earlier drawings were actually quite diaristic so they were drawings but they were diaries you know thoughts ideas antidotes dreams daydreams um earlier this year i, I actually released a notebook slash diary called Simple Observations with a company called Baron Fig, where oh, yeah. you, you know, be observant and present with the world, but you could also use it in diary form. And so it's so important to create diaries or to create journals because that's when you get to look back and that's when you get to see yourself. And then that's when you get to see the consistencies or the inconsistencies, or, or simply that's when you get to look back and be like, oh, I was a different person then. And I think we get so lost now of just taking so many pictures and then it goes away somewhere and we never see it again. But when you create something that is so tangible that you pick up and you write in and you look back at it, there's so much power in that. And so I really do suggest or promote or um, you know encourage people to create journals to create diaries when you can you just seem fearless which is it's such a um it's again so inspiring and i'm wondering if you're superhuman or are there things that um that scare you are you are there are there are you just fearless or are there things that that create blocks for you and and i see this just there's so much again respect and uh, admiration and um, uh, cheering for your achievements. I'm curious on the flip side of that, how you stay human. On the flip side of that, something I struggle with is I'm an extreme pessimist. <laughs> you know, the work I create is so light and it is so free and it is so bold, but inside, you know, I'm not that optimistic and I'm quite pessimistic. And, you know, I think the world is controlled by these bigger systems and there's no accountability or transparency out there. And so I think in a way, the reason I also create that work is because it does bring light to that side of me. It does bring hope to that side of me. It, it does bring something lighter to that side of me. Mm. What about the stuff you're doing or you've done in Times Square earlier this year? That was extraordinary. Is that on the order of the scale that you're starting you're talking about? Is that intimidating or is that is that where most of the new challenges uh, await for your work? Yeah, I'd be curious to know if some of our listeners have this, but you know, it at first, you know, I would walk around when I was younger and be like, "Oh, I can imagine my drawing there or I can imagine my drawing there." And now I happen to live in New York, Jersey City. So I walk around and, you know, Times Square, the biggest digital canvases, I, I can imagine my work there. Or I walk through, wait, you know, World Trade Center for the Oculus and I'd be like, I can imagine my work there. And with a lot of creation, it just starts with, as we spoke about earlier, with imagination. And I just happen to live in New York or in Jersey City where I get to see these canvases all the time and imagine my work on them. And I've just, just got very good at that grassroots thing of when you create some imagination, you put one foot in front of the other for a really long time, and then you can bring it into existence. Mm. Well, that also helps humanize because this idea of being 
you know, unknown and not speaking the language in Japan X number of years ago to being, you know, in the billboards at Times Square. Um, there's this uh, inspiration, this can-do attitude that doesn't seem to reflect the pessimistic part that you shared. Um, you've also, your TED Talk, which is also incredible, if anyone uh, is curious, just uh, look up Chantel Martin and uh, TED. And the title of the TED Talk is about freedom. It says how drawing can set you free. You talk in that TED Talk about following the line, and we've covered a little bit of that. I'm just curious about this freedom metaphor and the connection between your art and freedom. I'm obsessed with the word freedom and what it means to people. And, you know, if, if you watch the TED Talk, you, you'll hear that I'm talking about drawing is something that gave me the tool to set myself free. Because freedom is how we think. Freedom is how we approach the world. Freedom is how we wake up and get out of bed every day. Freedom is how we interact with people. And sometimes we need tools or we need access points to approach freedom. And the, the talk there is, is just about how drawing set me free, how drawing have given me this permission, how drawing has given me this freedom. And but hopefully in a way that we can all relate to through our own tools or through our own experiences. Is that the direction that you're exploring when you just shared us shared that notebook with us? Is the is color a, a next step in freedom from what you're so well known for, this black and white line drawing? Or is 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 are all is that part of your exploration of freedom? Or what ways is that manifesting itself now that you've got the tool? And theoretically, you've you know, you've um, broken out, and uh, by most outside accounts, could be free. Is there some continued quest for this freedom? I'm wondering if that's something that ever ends. Yeah. You know, color's always been there in my work. It just pops up in different places, or in as in different forms or mediums. I like you know, it over your left shoulder. Sorry to interrupt, but there's a, that color wash there. Is it's really cool expression of that exact point thank you but you know i think you know freedom is related to struggle you know um that the freedom to struggle the freedom to evolve the freedom to change the, the freedom to grow and that's all essentially i'm looking for is i'm looking for that freedom as an individual as an artist to create the work that i want to create to explore the themes that i want to explore to collaborate with the people that i want to collaborate to imagine the worlds that i want to imagine and have the freedom to do that. Um, last question, maybe there are a couple questions, but last theme that I want to explore is this concept of community. You talked a little bit about the community in Japan, how you know there were, there's some of it that worked and some of it didn't, and similarly in New York. And now there's a community of, there's a groundswell around your work, and I'm wondering, you know, is this something that you put effort effort behind and um, how important is it to you and to your work and to success or fulfillment? Like, talk talk to me a little bit about how you think of, of community. Can you hold that for while I grab my uh, <laughs> Yes, of course, of course. We don't want to run out of power. <laughs> One sec, community. Okay, check. Put, put it, we're putting a pin in it. We're happily to wait. In the meantime, I'm going to give a shout out to Yul Butler and Fernando and Tony and Ash and Antonia and Sam and Stephanie, uh, who are writing in from all over the world across a, a myriad of the platforms that we're streaming to. Um, thank you so much for, for participating and for helping shape the conversation today. And if you're just joining, uh, me. I'm here with Chantal Martin, and we are exploring her incredible art and the process behind that art and the human, the human and the process behind that art. And right now she's about to tell us the role that community plays in fulfillment, success as an artist, um, and the, anything that has to do with her work. Great. Well, no one knew there is I was down to 1%. Of the <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. So I'm glad you went and found a thing to plug in. That's great. We're, we're happy that you were able to stay with us. Thank you. 
you know, I think community is so important. And, you know, community is also something that I've struggled with um, being, you know, as my sisters used to call me when I was younger, a loner, you know, as someone that naturally navigates to themselves or wants to spend time alone or doesn't want to be around people or around the group. What I've learned over the last 10, 20 years is that community is so important. Community teaches you, community guides you, community supports you. And especially in an artistic community, you have your collaborators, you have people that you can learn with, you have people that you can grow with. And it's something that I constantly try and work on. You know, I've grown up with this mentality that you have to do it all by yourself. And, you know, no one cares about you, so you have to care about yourself and you have to do everything and you have to work hard and you have to create all of these infrastructures. And, you know, if you ask your community for help, then that's a weakness. And it's taken me so long to work on this and it's taken me so long to understand that when you have community, you have strength. When you have community, you have power. When you have community, you have support. When you have community, you have people that you can learn from and grow with. And community is so important and so powerful when it's used in the right way. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I think one of the comments that I have in response to that is, it sounded like you identified as an introvert, right? You, 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 you referenced that and, and whether it was a label that your sisters or it sounded like you, you also acknowledged that that was a way you, you sort of got energy. And I think it's always interesting for people who identify as introverts, this idea that how important community still is. And so it's not an identity or it's not about your identity as an introvert or an extrovert or an ambivert or anything but that community still plays a role in every aspect. Of, I mean, we're social animals at the end of the day, right? There's this desire to connect. And, and I think you put it in um, almost in, a, in asking for help. Um, is that something that you know now, or is that, is that something you're still learning? Where do you put yourself on the spectrum of understanding the role that community plays? Because I, I just think why I'm going back to this again is, it's just an area where I find so many people stumble and you seem to be just so connected to your community, you know, um, online, especially. It's definitely, for me, it's a work in progress and I think it will always will be. But I understand that if I want the work, if I want the philosophy, I've, I want this message to have an impact, to change to inspire, the best way, or one of the best ways it can do those things is through a strong community. It's through people believing in the work and through me believing in those people. And so I think there's something so symbiotic about that. Um, but it takes a journey to get there, especially when you're coming from a place where you feel like you don't deserve these things. You have to work for community um, and, you know, sometimes, like I said, I'm a little bit of a pessimist. So I often think, well, why would a community want to support me? Even though I'm trying to support people as much as I can and do all these things, because that's naturally why I want to do. But sometimes for those things to naturally work both ways and feel deserving of both ways, there's a journey that we need to go on. I cannot thank you enough for sharing uh, so much about you personally, about your process, your work, the world. Um, I just want to say thank you. And again, to the people who are watching from all over the world who are uh, huge fans of your work and champions, I put myself in that category. Um, I want to say thank you first and acknowledge that you are amazing and incredibly inspiring. So first of all, thank you. Um, also, if I'm noticing on your site this idea in in support of, for example, community, that you can um, give a book or get a book. If you're a student and the book is hard for you to to come up with the money, um, then uh, it's there's another button here to be a donor and to give or gift a book. And I would encourage people to check that out. That's again at ChantelMartinLines.com. 
Um, earlier, you told us a few coordinates on how to uh, follow and connect with your work. I wonder if we can recap those again. Instagram is one of the areas you, you sent us, which is Chantel underscore Martin. Uh, a couple others again. Can you retrace those for us? Yeah, I would just say make sure Chantel spelled right, S-H-A-N-T-E-L-L, -L, and then, you know, the world's your oyster. You know. <laughs> You've got it from there. Um, website. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and for sharing your work with the world. Incredibly inspiring and um You've got fans all over the place uh, around the world here in this community, and I want to say thank you. Well, thank you so much, Chase. And I'm actually really, you know, excited to jump into creative life. You know, it looks like it's been up and running for a long time, and I wasn't aware of it, and it seemed like a perfect time for me to get into it and get aware of it. So, you know, happy and excited to explore everything that you've been up to, too. Uh, I appreciate it. We'll make sure you have all of the access you need and, and we'll do what we can to uh, have you teach us some drawing. So I'm grateful for our time. I'll follow up with you separately on that point. And in service of the community, want to say thank you all for your questions and comments and support. You know, we're a community of 10 million strong here at Creative Live, and we believe that creativity, connection, humanity, all those things are critical to the future of the universe. Um, and so thanks everyone for being a part of it all. Um, Hopefully we'll be back in your ears or uh, in video form for your eyes again tomorrow, if not sooner. Thanks again. Signing off. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to